tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I think our anxiety level is higher than it's been in a while. Coronavirus kills six people in Washington state. It's not going to be a great year. The virus also has YVR forecasting a loss of nearly a million passengers this year. It made me feel gross. Um, I was really upset. Targeting women online. A man running a popular Vancouver housing rentals group is accused of abuse. This is CBC Vancouver News. We are in uncharted territory. We have never seen before a, resp a, res a respiratory pathogen that's capable of community transmission, but at the same time, which can also be contained with the right measures. Good evening. The World Health Organization signaling tonight we may be inching ever closer to a global pandemic. And now there's been a sudden deadly spike in severe coronavirus cases in the Seattle area. Six people have now died. As Greg Rasmussen reports tonight, it started in a nursing home and does not appear to be travel related, meaning it's spreading on its own. Four of the people who died were from the Life Care Center. Colleen Mallory is worried about her elderly mother. Her roommate was very sick. Um, they were isolated to her room, um, not allowed to go out in the hall or to the dining room or anywhere. Well, I found out today that her roommate has been taken out of there. So I'm assuming she has a virus. All those who died were admitted to the Evergreen Health Center, which is isolating new patients and taking extra measures to protect frontline workers. We expect the number of cases will continue to increase in the coming days and weeks, and we're taking this situation extremely seriously. Also, there's growing concern over person-to-person -person spread in the community. Unfortunately, we are now starting uh, to find more COVID-19 cases in Washington. Um, that appear to be acquired locally here in Washington. Um, and we now know that the virus is actively spreading um, in some communities here in Washington. On the streets, some are on edge. When we were at Costco yesterday, they didn't have any rice and they didn't have any flour. This man is in the high risk category, over 60 with a compromised immune system. We don't go to events. Uh, we were gonna go to a movie theater the other day and we canceled that. Because you have no control about who's around you and um, or the surfaces and cleanliness disinfecting that's a really big deal we've survived a lot of other things we'll survive this so i'm not too terribly worried about it others are stockpiling supplies i just saw the news uh, this morning like more people got the virus with not enough spare hospital beds the state's governor announced they're buying an entire motel to house people facing quarantine we have moved to a new stage in the fight to contain mitigate and manage this outbreak. For officials, the balancing act here is to get people to take this seriously enough that they take precautions, but not so much that they panic. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Kirkland, Washington. And BC's top doctor says the six deaths in Washington state are a reminder to health officials of how important it is to continue to work to contain the virus. That's a challenging situation to be in. There's not widespread community transmission in Washington state, and certainly there is not here in BC, and we're confident of that. And my colleagues in Washington state are working very hard to try and track down and determine everybody who's been in contact with the people who've been affected in the United States. Dr. Henry says our province still has eight confirmed cases of COVID-19. She also says travelers from Iran will now be screened at BC airports, and if they appear to have symptoms, they will be asked to contact a health officer and self-quarantine for 14 days. She reminds people to stay home and stay away from others if they aren't feeling well. And you saw people in Seattle there stockpiling supplies. While well, we are seeing some of that coronavirus panic here in our local stores, many facing long lineups, empty shelves and frazzled shoppers as people in Metro Vancouver try to stock up on goods. But as Leanne Young reports, health officials are asking people to calm down and say there's no need to rush out and buy. I don't know. Two bags of rice, the last items on Lin Tung's quarantine shopping list. I went five star, super star, 
uh, no fuel, TNT, ADA, and hang around Vietnamese stuff was packed with people. We bought so much like for, for emergency, you know. She bought enough to stay home for a month. Tang was just one of the hordes of people out stockpiling this weekend. Toilet paper, stacks and stacks of toilet paper, along with cleaning supplies and non-perishable foods. We don't want something like China, like no, no food to eat. So we better be safe. Worries over coronavirus is leading to lines wrapped around stores, a spike in sales, and this weekend, a rush on certain items. A lot of people were actually looking for um, cleaning aids, um, disinfectant wipes, um, paper towels, uh, toilet paper. We have all of those products in stock right now. There were some empty shelves, but Chu says they've been able to restock. What they can't keep on shelves, though. Masks, um, the hand sanitizers are actually asked for quite frequency. Rubber gloves as well, too. Um, those are the three that we're having troubles actually bringing in and keeping in stock right now. However, we do get shipments every now and then of it coming in. In a call with media, Canada's top medical authority, Dr. Theresa Tam, says there's no need for Canadians to suddenly stockpile anything. Canadians have time to get prepared and they should use that time and be sensible about the whole thing. So there's no need to go at it in a massive rush. She says it's smart to plan for interruptions if you do get sick from COVID-19. Think about who would take care of your kids or dependents and talk to friends or neighbours about checking in on each other. BC's health minister reminded the public again. It sounds like we're repeating ourselves. Just wash our hands. It's stay home when you're sick. Stay home from work. Stay home from school sound advice that shoppers like Tung are listening to while also remaining prepared. Well, it's come very close to Seattle now and we come to Vancouver, so we kind of scared, so we are pack up. Pack enough so that you'd get by in any emergency. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. COVID-19 is having a huge impact on the tourism industry. The timing for Vancouver International Airport, which is in the middle of a major expansion, is hardly ideal. And tonight we can report why VR is revising its passenger forecast for this year, mainly because of coronavirus. They are just a few months away from finishing work on YVR's new international terminal expansion project. It's expected to welcome passengers and planes in mid-June. Yes, it's not uh, the perfect time to open a building, but we'll have, uh, we'll have airlines that need those four gates. Work on the $300 million terminal began five years ago, when the number of people traveling through YVR was expected to take off. But coronavirus now has the airport revising its passenger forecast for 2020. Right now, in February and March, we're seeing about a 50% reduction in travel to mainland China. Um, and uh, so we see uh, probably a 3 to 5% drop in passengers over the year. It means 800,000 to 1.3 million fewer passengers this year. They were expecting 29 million in 2020. Coronavirus, along with ongoing Canada-China tensions and the grounding of MAX 8s, will also mean a financial hit for the airport. They're now forecasting a 5 to 10 percent drop in revenue. A large part of the business of the airport depends on passenger footfall for everything from parking to duty-free and retail, food and beverage, and uh, yeah, everybody's feeling it. The hope is the flexibility of the expanded terminal will help weather the storm. We've been through this before. We have uh, huge corporate memories of the ups and downs of aviation. The last 10 years, we've grown by 60%, but you always know something could happen, and something did. And now we have a really nice terminal that's going to open, but it's not too big. Yeah, and it is designed that way. It's designed actually to expand and contract with passenger fluctuations. Okay. So when there's economic downturns or a situation like COVID-19, uh, they think they can uh, they can weather the storm there. So tomorrow we're going to have more on the uh, the new terminal out there. We've got okay. a full tour of it today, so we'll have more on that tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. And as the world enters uncharted territory trying to control the spread of coronavirus, the head of the World Health Organization says all travelers need to do their part. We will have more on the global battle against COVID-19 later in the program. <laughs> Well, some fear for their safety. A number of women in B.C. say they've been bombarded with racist and misogynistic messages online. 
They're accusing a man who ran a popular Vancouver housing rentals group on Facebook. As Andrea Ross reports, he has not been charged, but it's a pattern of behavior that goes back eight years. And a warning, this story does contain some strong language. You are too much of a sore loser and starved with attention whore. Naomi Kim started receiving abusive messages like that one soon after joining the Facebook group Vancouver Rentals and Roommates. Kim was looking for a place to live, having recently moved here from Korea. The group had 55,000 members sharing new rental listings in the Lower Mainland. Upon requesting to join the private group, some women received a flirty message from the moderator, Josh Liu. I think it was a little bit weird, but didn't think it was completely wrong. But when he asked her on a date and she declined, his language became abusive. It got worse after she publicly posted some of his messages. He then bombarded her and a friend with racist and misogynistic messages from his account and one believed to be a fake. After this conversation, I couldn't go out, go outside for two days. Yeah. Were you worried? Yeah, I was worried. Kim is one of 11 women who provided screenshots of their conversations with Liu. Some go back eight years. Vancouver police are investigating, but Liu has not been charged. He did not respond to multiple requests for comment from CBC News. Olivia Bolt says Liu sent her explicit messages in 2012 when she met him at a Latin dance studio in Vancouver. Teasing older men with your sexy little skirts is unacceptable, he said. Bolt was 16 years old at the time. It made me feel gross. Bolt says she reported him to police in 2019. She says she was told nothing could be done because she didn't tell Liu to stop. I sent the police my screenshots showing him, showing them exactly the harassment that I experienced. Um, but that still doesn't count as criminal because I didn't engage back with him <laughs> to say, to, to tell him to stop doing it. Liu has been banned from three Vancouver dance studios, including D2, run by Jennifer Dancy. I can show you the code of conduct that we wrote for this studio. She got several complaints from women about his behavior. Now, shocked to see it hasn't stopped. How do you stop this kind of behavior? You know, it, the police or lawyers will tell you it's not illegal, but the damage that it does emotionally to women is, it's devastating. Kim has also reported Liu to police. She is speaking out because she says more needs to be done to stop online harassment. You know, I love this city. I love this city since I arrived. And then I just want this city to be safe and good place for women to live even like immigrants and international students like me. Liu's Facebook accounts have been disabled and he is no longer moderator of the group. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. Work has resumed today on the natural gas pipeline in northern BC that's been at the center of blockades and protests across the country. While Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs at the province and federal government have reached a proposed agreement to acknowledge land title rights established more than 20 years ago, the parties still don't agree on the pipeline. That, that's, that's an issue that um, uh, we've agreed to disagree on at this point. And the, and, and the press forward is to deal with the rights and title of the Wet'suwet'en people uh, a unity of the Wet'suwet'en people uh, in, a, in, a, in, in the governance structure. And all of these things are outstanding and have been for 23 years. Fraser says the lack of recognition of land rights is the root cause of the issue. Work on the pipeline was paused while the talks were ongoing. RCMP patrols along a service road leading to the pipeline stopped during discussions but have now resumed. The new agreement needs the approval of the Wet'suwet'en people. The province says... Details of the deal will not be released. The BC NDP is introducing a new law this week to prevent government from scooping up any potential ICBC surpluses and funneling that cash elsewhere. Attorney General David Eby says the goal for ICBC is not to generate significant profits. It's to operate at near break-even and then pass on savings to drivers. Eby had hinted at this reform in the fall. He says the previous government treated ICBC like an ATM by taking a total of $1.2 out of the corporation. 
are. Our intentions are that if there is any extra money left over from these reforms, that they will go back to drivers in the form of various benefits, including lower rates. Uh, and we're putting that into the law to be as clear as we can, uh, because if you don't do that, uh, it invites people in politics uh, or who have a vested interest to speculate that government is doing this for different reasons. Now, any future government wanting to take profits from ICBC would first have to reverse this law. ICBC lost $2.5 billion over the past two years, but is projecting a modest surplus for the fiscal year ahead. Well, it could be a bridge or a tunnel. Six options are now on the table for a rapid transit line link between downtown Vancouver and the North Shore. It's part of the plan to try to relieve some of the congestion that's clogged the crossing for decades. Dan Burt's here live uh, with a look at this. He's been looking at the options. So, Dan, what are they? Well, what could be a fabled third fixed crossing to and from the North Shore? Let's take a look. Let's start near Stanley Park at the First Narrows. A tunnel could run from downtown to Lonsdale near the Lionsgate Bridge or closer to Brockton Point and Cole Harbour. In the center there, moving east, a tunnel could run from downtown to West Vancouver via Lonsdale. And closer to the Second Narrows, a new bridge could run from downtown to Lonsdale or go from Burnaby to Lonsdale along the Second Narrows. And lastly, they could use the existing Ironworkers Memorial Bridge for a link to Lonsdale. Anyone who has driven or taken a bus across the Lionsgate or the Ironworkers in either directions knows how incredibly slow and frustrating it can be. People who live on the North Shore have been calling for transit alternatives for some time, too. Now, besides the bridges, there is the route in the middle, the sea bus, which can carry about 385 passengers at a time, and that crossing takes about 12 minutes. No new bridge lanes, though, connecting the North Shore to Vancouver have been built since 1968, and the Transportation Ministry says they can't expand either the Lionsgate or the Iron Workers Memorial Bridges. As for when something might get built, there's no firm date. As for a price tag... All six options fall within the same ballpark of each other. Uh, it's still too preliminary right now for us to release cost estimates, but it is definitely in the billions of dollars. So Ma says the technical feasibility study is said to be finished by this summer, then it goes to TransLink's 2050 plan, and then it goes to the Mayor's Council to decide. So until then, pack your patience if you're heading to and from the North Shore. Anita, Mike? All right, Dan, thanks. One person has been arrested in connection with a fire that tore through a CN rail building in Prince Rupert. The fire broke out yesterday afternoon and burned for hours. RCMP were called around 4 p.m. and arrested a young man shortly after for suspected arson. The incident isn't believed to be related to recent protests at CN rail sites across the country. Investigators are continuing to comb through surveillance footage. Brett's here with our first look at the forecast. I was out at uh, YVR today mm -hmm. where they, as you know, Brett, keep track of the official oh, rainfall yeah. totals. Yes. I can confirm. <laughs> It was raining at the airport today. <laughs> yes, it absolutely was. And I mean, you've probably heard the expression about spring showers. I did want to wish you guys personally and everyone watching at home a happy meteorological spring because we do things a little bit early. We start our official spring season on March 1st. So this is now full onto spring mode. And these showers, they are definitely continuing and right in fashion, I think, with what's happening. If we zoom in a little bit closer to this, you're going to see that, yeah, we've been in this steady stream of rain for much of the day coming from the northwest and temperatures as a result have drastically been impacted by this. YVR today did not get above six degrees, and that is much colder than we would expect it to be for this time of year. And in fact, it's still there. It's right at about six degrees. You go a little bit farther east, Pitt Meadows only at three, so there is definitely a bit of a chill in the air. And the warmest place in the entire country today, well, that would be Asuyas at about 11 degrees. Now, in terms of what we can be expecting as we go ahead into tonight and into tomorrow, it is going to be a transition day. So we're talking about how these showers right now, these are going to be kind of ending over the next little while by about midnight just going to become a bit of a cloudy story and same thing will go for tomorrow morning though a little bit on the chilly side by the afternoon though if we flash forward about 24 hours from now these showers are going to come back and then we'll get at least one nice day this week and i'm going to tell you which day that is when i come back okay brett thanks very much and a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. 
It's costing the healthcare system big bucks. So why are costly cancer drugs being thrown out on a regular basis? We'll tell you after the break. And thanks for joining us on our live stream tonight, where we are always ad-free during the regular TV commercial break. Well, there was a very excited plane load of athletes arriving back to PEI early this morning. They just wrapped up the Special Olympics Canada Winter Games. As Steve Bruce tells us, they came home with medals, personal best performances, and a lot of great memories. Oh, here's the celebration. Yeah. Just hours after landing back on the island, these PEI medal winners are already feeling nostalgic. How could you not after the week they just had? Scale down to, scale down to 10, dandy. <laughs> really dandy. It's just I couldn't have asked for a better week. Like, it was just phenomenal. PEI sent 38 athletes to the Special Olympics Winter Games. They came home with 25 medals and 17 personal bests. Bruce Love. These athletes won gold in floor hockey, cross-country skiing, and bowling. Three gold medal moments they won't soon forget. Yeah. What was that feeling like when you realized that you had one? Just really excited and happy in that. <laughs> when I was going around the track, uh, one of the guys was saying, come on, tell me there's a gold medal waiting for you. So I just shuffled along. When I got almost to the, the, the finish line, I heard my sister Susan ringing her bell, yelling and screaming. Billy. The island's floor hockey team won in dramatic fashion, scoring in overtime of the championship game to take the gold. We all started celebrating. It's awesome. like such a feel-good moment. Like, my whole team was working their tails off. And yet all three of these athletes say their fondest memories from the games didn't actually come from winning. Oh, it's totally great cheering on other people, other skiers. There's a lot of memories, I guess, about this, this match. Have some fun seeing other uh, new people. And I have some of the Alberta team on Facebook now, and they're just tremendous guys. And, like, we were talking about the games, and he was telling me how I was standing on my head, and I was telling them how they had some amazing shots. And these three, like many on the PEI team, compete in summer sports, too, and are already thinking ahead to the Special Olympics Canada Summer Games in Alberta in two years' time. Steve Bruce, CBC News, Charlottetown. Good news, and lots of BC athletes participating yes. in that as well. Uh, quite a few cross-country skiers from the Okanagan, some mm -hmm. snowshoers, and many more. We did okay. Uh, I... I Check the standings. Know. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find out. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got more coming up in just a second here uh, on this uh, story about costly cancer drugs being thrown out. We'll tell you why and go public coming up in just seconds. tonight that costly cancer drugs are being thrown out on a regular basis and it's costing taxpayers millions of dollars every year. Rosa Marcatelli with our Go Public unit tells us it all has to do with the way the medications are packaged. This is the medication that I ended up having to um, get from the pharmacy. Medication that costs almost $8,000 per vial. I thought to myself, wow, am I ever glad I'm a Canadian? Am I ever glad that I don't have to put out of pocket for this? The price was surprising enough until Deb Hebert had the drug injected by a nurse and realized her dose only required about three quarters of what was in the vial. The rest was thrown out and a new vial opened the next day for her second dose. The remainder of that one thrown out too. Hebert is on leave from her job in finance at CBC while she battles non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This researcher says millions of dollars worth of cancer drugs are being wasted because drug makers only distribute the medications in one-size-fits-all vials that hold too much for most patients. Leftovers are often tossed over concerns about sharing vials and a short shelf life. What people don't realize is that wastage is actually a real cost that's uh, borne by um, probably the provinces or hospitals or ultimately the taxpayers. 
He worked on a study that looked at 12 high-priced injectable cancer drugs. It found $102 million worth of medication is being wasted over a three-year period. One solution, says this drug policy researcher, is to force drug makers to produce different vial sizes to reduce waste. The UK did that four years ago and is now saving millions a year in drug costs. It's appalling that, again, we have so many demands on our health care dollars for drugs and doctors and hospitals and so on to see this kind of waste. He says the group that negotiates prescription drug prices in Canada has to make different vial sizes part of the deal when choosing which drugs to buy. But the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance won't say if it does that, only that negotiations are confidential at the request of the manufacturer. Sanofi, which makes Hebert's medication, says it sells the drugs in one vial size because it's a typical dose for the majority of the patient population when you take spillage into account. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. As tensions between the resource industry and environmental activists reach new heights, the Prime Minister is trying to reassure mining executives. As David Cochran reports, Justin Trudeau has a plan and is emphasizing a need to find common ground on the way forward. The kinds of opportunities. An anxious audience in an uncertain time for heavy industry and a period of political unrest for a prime minister. What we need to do is build common ground. But common ground has been in short supply when it comes to climate and the economy. This mining conference was targeted by protesters this weekend, building on the blockades and barricades that stop trains across the country. All of it fueling a climate of uncertainty that, a week ago, led to the shelving of Alberta's tech frontier oil sands mine. I don't know why the government of Canada has been unable to get its act together on these issues. But let's look so in this speech, Trudeau outlined a process to get Canada's act together. In the coming year, we want to hear from you on how Canada should innovate and transform our economy to keep good jobs here and create new ones. The start of consultations with industry, Indigenous people and all Canadians on how to get to net zero emissions by 2050 without crippling growth. The global economy is rapidly changing. Not just the global economy, but global finance as well. The giants of private equity are changing their investment strategies in response to climate change, making heavy emitting projects like the oil sands less viable unless they are backstopped by a clear environmental plan. And for a country like Canada, where the national economy was built on the natural resources sector, there's a big transformation ahead. A big transformation and some big conversations. Trudeau will bring this same message to the table next week when he sits down with Canada's premiers and national Indigenous leaders. And federal sources say those words will be backed up by specific measures in the upcoming budget. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. A CBC News exclusive investigation has uncovered problems in Canada's growing surrogacy industry. It's illegal to pay a surrogate in Canada, but you can reimburse her for pregnancy-related expenses. In a series called Baby Business, reporter Chris Glover introduces us to several families who fear their vulnerability has left them paying more than they should have. Since I can remember, I wanted kids. For Anna Camille Tucci, a baby almost didn't happen. In 2017, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. But this past December, a surrogate delivered her son. Tucci agreed to reimburse her a monthly maximum of nearly $2,000 for pregnancy expenses. We thought that though she would never really actually meet that max. But the surrogate did every month. Tucci had paid an agency to handle the process and the money. Canadian Fertility Consulting, or CFC. This. this expense breakdown is all she could get. This kind of made us think, wow, where is all this money coming from? With categories like $700 monthly paid out for groceries. You know, the two of us together, I don't think we spend that much. CFC's policy is to provide receipts after the birth. Canadian law says reimbursements must be pregnancy related or those paying could face 10 years in prison and a half a million dollar fine. No one wants to be in a situation where um, they're caught doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing without even knowing. We found four other families who used CFC services and have similar concerns. One father paid $5,000 for his surrogate's expenses, even though she miscarried in the first month. Oh, a lottery ticket. 
We reviewed his surrogate's receipts with his lawyer and found a lottery ticket, duplicates, and many dated before he'd met his surrogate. This is not playing within the rules, so it's putting everybody at risk. A former CFC surrogate whose voice we've disguised says the agency encouraged her to submit as many receipts as possible. You just save all of your receipts from the second you're matched. Doesn't matter anything you save it. So it's a little shady, like a lot shady. CFC's owner, Leah Swanberg, is the only person in Canada to have been charged with paying surrogates. She pleaded guilty in 2013 and paid a $60,000 fine. In an initial interview, Swanberg said she now has six employees reviewing receipts. I will not take that risk for any client or any surrogate. Um, and so I am extremely diligent with my team. But later refused to address specific allegations we found. It puts us in such a vulnerable situation because, again, at the end of the day, all we want is that baby and we'll do anything for it. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. New federal regulations coming in June introduce a form to declare expenses, but still don't guarantee parents access to receipts prior to reimbursement. Watch tomorrow for part two of our investigation in which we dig into the lack of medical standards in Canada and how surrogates are being put at risk. More than 3,000 deaths globally, six just south of the border in Washington state. So has the level of concern over coronavirus changed? More on that after the break. It's been years since Patty Dugan has been in a classroom setting like this. The retired teacher was looking for a way to give back, and she found it at Burnaby South Secondary. Each week, Dugan volunteers to teach refugee teens English after school. I'm having fun. I'm the one who's getting. I, I go home thinking about what I can do next week. I, you know, I, I just, I love it. Um, I mean, I love the kids. I love the laughter. And these guys are great laughers. Yeah. <laughs> these high school students arrived from Syria a few months ago with little or no English. Because of their age, they only have a few years left in the school system. So a class like this can make all the difference. Most of them come with educational gaps. They come from refugee camps, especially those who will start their um, school life in high schools, they would need as much support as possible so that they can graduate. What is the first in addition to their regular ESL classes during the school day, Dugan spends an extra hour with them every week, teaching them English phrases and words. I, I'm already seeing what they're getting out there, you know, because I only see them one week at a time. I can see if we were counting words, I can see how many more words they have this week than they had last week. They're, they're just absorbing English at a phenomenal rate. There are no tests and no marks, and the teens say they feel relaxed in this environment. We spoke to the students and they love it. They think that this is very helpful and it helps them to feel more comfortable. When they go back to school tomorrow, they already feel much better than the day before. And we think that this way we accomplished a lot. You cook in your oven. The program will continue until the end of the school year. Bal Bratch, CBC News, Burnaby. Hard times of dog Steve Boric for several years. For the most part, the 58-year-old has survived on temporary day-to-day -day work and living outside. A little less than a year ago, he lived under a tree in a clearing on the edge of the Fraser River. It was a home he assembled with salvaged building supplies and tarps. In July, it looked like a financial windfall could change everything if he could show some valid photo ID. He had played $8 on Kino and won $25,000. But Bork hasn't had ID for years, so the first step was to get a new Quebec birth certificate. What he got instead was a long road of bureaucratic twists and turns and dead ends. You can't get a birth certificate without ID, and you can't get ID without a birth certificate. 
What should have taken three weeks took three months. With help from NDP MLA Carol James's office, his Quebec birth certificate has finally arrived in Vancouver. I just think there's got to be a better way, a better system. You know, Service Canada doesn't seem to want to help. But, you know, it doesn't care who, who you talk to. I tried a different MP because you got Carol James involved, right? I tried this other guy in Surrey after the election. He, he got booted out. So that was my chance gone from him. Next stop was ICBC, where he was now able to apply for BC photo ID. He should have two pieces of it in the next couple of weeks. I'm really happy that this worked out. Yeah. yeah. What did you, you said to be in there? What does this mean now? Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I just want this city to be safe, good place for women to live. A man who ran a popular Vancouver housing rentals group on Facebook is being accused of targeting women for dates online. They say when they rejected him, they were bombarded with racist, misogynistic, and abusive messages. Many of the women are new immigrants and say they fear for their safety. I had a liver transplant, so did my wife. So yeah, this is pretty scary. Six people have died from coronavirus in the Seattle area. Researchers say the virus may have been circulating undetected for weeks in Washington state. BC is warning people not to panic and says we have the right measures in place to protect. It's not going to be a great year. And YVR is forecasting a loss of between 800,000 and 1.3 million passengers this year, mainly because of coronavirus. This comes in the middle of a major expansion for the airport. YVR CEO hopes the flexibility of the expanded international terminal will help weather the storm. And Canadian officials want travelers arriving from certain regions heavily infected with COVID-19 to isolate themselves. But as Vicodopia explains, the world's second most affected country isn't one of them. Gary and Teresa Isaacs aren't seeing any visitors. They've cut themselves off from the outside since returning from a trip to Japan and South Korea five days ago. They feel fine, but still canceled a welcome home dinner with family. I mean, if we had gone to that and, you know, infected someone else and they got sick, I mean, we would have felt terrible about that. South Korea is now the worst affected country outside of China. When the Isaacs landed in Canada on Wednesday, Gary says border officials didn't ask about their travels. There were no questions on, you know, were you in Seoul? Do you have any symptoms? No direction, should you self-quarantine or anything like that. It's a different story for travelers from Iran with new measures announced today. Iran is still struggling to contain the outbreak, so Canada now wants anyone coming from the country to isolate themselves for two weeks but not Japan or South Korea, or at least not yet. Every traveler, every Canadian has a role to play. So if you are traveling or have traveled, this is the right thing to do. I think that it's very difficult to just keep adding uh, many, many different countries to specific messaging. For questions, those who are... The World Health Organization had the same message. Let's calm down and do the right things. The WHO again resisted calls to declare a pandemic, saying that should only happen if the international community fails to stop new infections from continuing to cross borders. In some places, we're not seeing the level of uh, response that we expected. The window of opportunity is narrowing. A window for the world and Canada to control an outbreak that continues to spread. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. At Science World, you're looking live here. The first week of March is looking, well, rather traditional. What does that mean? Brett will tell us after the break.
The weather update is brought to you by The Body Shop that always takes you back to your happy place. BC's favorite, Craftsman Collision, Air Miles, and Bigger Smiles. Brett's back with a look at the forecast. Mm -hmm. Brett says it's a very traditional start to March. Yeah, meaning that we're not going to be entering into a particularly, say, dry or rainy pattern. We're going to have some days that are going to be showery, some really nice mm -hmm. days too, and we're just going to go back and forth. Spring is known as a traditional, sorry, a transitional <laughs> season, I <laughs> should say. Bag, a really? mixed bag, you could say <laughs> that as well. So we're going to see really quite a little bit of everything, including snow. Now, not in Vancouver, but if you're traveling, I'm going to get right to that right now because this matters for you. But let's take a look back at the morning how it played out across the region. Oh, hey there, car wash effect. Yes, lots of rain was had all the way across the south coast, not just Vancouver, many places under this constant stream of rain that was coming through from the northwest. As I mentioned, that kind of had a huge impact on our temperatures today. And while it is presently raining, there is going to be a little bit of a relief in sight. I'm going to walk you through the timing of that, really, by about midnight tonight. We're going to go and get a little bit of a break from that rain. It's going to be remaining cloudy throughout much of the overnight, but by tomorrow, Tomorrow afternoon, it's going to be coming back. So really, you can imagine about a 12-hour break here, and that's going to be bringing rain fairly widespread, pretty well everywhere into the lower mainland. And I'd be budgeting maybe about 10, 10 to 20 millimeters tops with all of this. But I did mention I alluded to a little bit of snow, and this is why we're going to be dealing with the system coming across from the Pacific, and you're seeing, of course, snow up to the farther northern places where we'd expect it to be. But as we get through Tuesday, if anyone's going to be driving along the Coquihalla, I already have some suspicions here that we could be seeing maybe. 10, potentially even 20 centimeters of snow accumulating between Hope and Merritt. And this is going to be happening about tomorrow evening, so do keep that in mind. By contrast, you go farther inland toward the Kootenays, tomorrow is looking like a sunny day. Temperatures in Nelson could be up to 13 degrees. Sounds very spring-like indeed. And farther to the north, yes, yeah, certainly a few flurries still expected for places like Prince George and our northern and central coastal regions in the interior at least. Now, in terms of a look at our temperatures, look at that. So it's tomorrow down at about 13 degrees degrees as a high going to be cooling down a little bit more as we get to midweek but in terms of our freezing levels here just to mention a quick little peek at some of our uh, mountains if you're going up to Cyprus expect snow pretty well on every single day going to get a lot of fresh powder there but notice that sunshine on Wednesday that's obviously not just going to be an issue for the mountains we're going to be dealing with probably the sunniest day of the week is going to be on Wednesday so once we get through the showers on Tuesday bring out the sunglasses for Wednesday and Thursday Friday Saturday classic spring conditions a few showers here and there but definitely not a wash out by any means. All right, thanks, Brett. You're welcome. Tens of thousands of migrants are lining Turkey's border with Greece, but there's a stark warning not to attempt to cross over. After the break, we look at what's unfolding there.
Israelis went to the polls again today in their third election in less than a year. Final results are expected later tonight, but as Margaret Evans reports, exit polls are showing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing corruption charges with a lead over challenger Benny Gantz. We're outside a polling station in Tel Aviv, and the streets here today are especially crowded because people in Israel are given the day off to vote. You can see the cafes behind me are chock-a-block. Employers here won't be so happy about it, though, because this is the third time in less than 12 months that Israelis have gone to the polls. This is a country that's stuck. Turnout is always important in an election, but it's especially so here. The Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is the longest serving Prime Minister in this country's history. He is tied and has been for the past year, neck and neck in the polls with his main challenger, Benny Gantz, a former military chief and leader of the Blue and White Party. I love Netanyahu and uh, I want him to be the Prime Minister. I think that he is like uh, perfect for Israel. I want to see change. I think it's time to refresh, to restart, to reboot to get something else. So getting the vote out is important to both of them, but there are concerns today that fears over the coronavirus might prevent people from going to the polls. Israel has taken the threat of the spread very seriously. It's advised citizens here not to travel abroad, and it does have cases of the coronavirus. But it set up 16 special polling stations in the country for people who are under quarantine to go to, to vote. We visited one of them earlier. We could see people going in with their ID cards under plastic. We could see people in full hazmat suits taking those. They're washing their hands, putting gloves on before going in to cast their ballot. Um, the leaders from all of the major political parties are telling people it's safe to go out and vote and to do so. And as what, from what we're hearing so far, the turnout has been high. It is an unprecedented situation in this country to have voted this many times in the same year. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Tel Aviv. A huge wave of Syrian migrants have been trying to get into Greece since last week. That's when Turkey opened its border with Europe, saying it couldn't handle a new surge of refugees leaving, fighting Syria. Rene Filipponi shows us the growing desperation of thousands hoping to move. An already dangerous journey made even more frightening as the Greek Coast Guard fire warning shots into the water in an attempt to deter migrants from landing on its shores. Earlier, a young boy drowned on a crossing from Turkey to Greece. And here, thousands are being held back at a Turkish land border by the Greek army. Still, the desperation to get to Europe is growing. For almost four years now, Turkey has honored a deal to keep migrants from reaching Europe in exchange for billions of euros in aid. But last week, the Turkish government said enough, saying it couldn't support the ever-swelling numbers on its territory. The Greek government is accusing Turkey of using innocent people for political gain in an attempt to pressure the EU to back Turkey in the Syrian conflict. The situation in Syria has been escalating, particularly in the rebel-held province of Idlib, as the Syrian regime fights to regain control. Turkey is supporting the rebels. Today, new threats from the Turkish president to the Syrian government to withdraw. Turkey stepped up its offensive against the regime after more than 30 of its soldiers were killed last week. The fighting has displaced nearly a million people, Many are headed for the Turkish border. I acknowledge that Turkey is in a difficult situation uh, concerning the, with regards to uh, the refugees and the migrants. But uh, what we see now cannot be uh, an answer or a solution. Humanitarian groups are calling the situation at the borders heartbreaking, urging all parties to take immediate action and stop trapping people in horrid conditions. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, the race to become the Democratic presidential nominee is closer than ever before. Former Vice President Joe Biden seems to have locked down some key endorsements ahead of the crucial Super Tuesday vote. 
But as Katie Simpson reports, another player may upend the race between Biden and Bernie Sanders. Michael Bloomberg is about to find out if his unconventional campaign is resonating. The former New York City mayor's name will be on the ballot tomorrow for the very first time as voters in 14 states go to the polls for Super Tuesday. I've won uh, three elections so far. I don't plan to start losing now. Bloomberg met with volunteers in suburban Virginia today, vowing to stay in the race as the field narrows. Senator Amy Klobuchar suspended her campaign, as did former Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Both are expected to endorse Joe Biden. Well, I talked to Mayor Pete and to Amy Klobuchar. Uh, both uh, talked to him, Pete, earlier today and Amy just a little while ago. And I wish them all the best. I thought both of them uh, behaved themselves, is a nice way to phrase it, but they represented their uh, country and their states very well. And I felt sorry for them, but uh, I'm in it to win it. Bloomberg has long been seen by some voters as a backup candidate, a high-profile option for moderate Democrats if Biden's campaign faltered. Thank you, thank you, thank you, South Carolina! But with his enormous win on Saturday in South Carolina, the former vice president is finally catching up to frontrunner Bernie Sanders. I just want Trump, 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 Schlump, Glump to be history, November whatever, 2020. Bloomberg supporters are unfazed by the evolving race, though some would not be surprised if he's thinking long and hard about the future of his candidacy. And I feel he'll make the right decision. I feel he makes the best decisions besides making the right decision. Michael Bloomberg has been polling well in key states, including California, Texas, and right here in Virginia. It could be enough to split the moderate vote between him and Joe Biden, paving the way for Bernie Sanders to have a very big night. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Manassas, Virginia. Coming up, how a new belly dancing class is helping seniors find their inner Shakira.
Tuesday on the early edition, Doreen Manuel's new documentary, Unseated Chiefs, takes us back to 1969, when First Nations leaders, including her father, George, rejected Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau's proposed white paper. Doreen Manuel will be our guest. Well, staying active at any age is important, but even more so for seniors. Yes, one group in Ontario is taking that to heart. CBC videographer Katarina Georgieva found out it has them jiggling like J-Lo. One, two, three, circle, and switch. When I saw that they had belly dancing, I thought, oh, I got to try that. You know, I, growing up, you didn't want to move your hips, you didn't want to move your breasts, but, you know, it's like suddenly you're welcome to do it. And after a certain age, who cares? So <laughs> that's what I just did. Everybody's got a Shakira trying to get out. <laughs> It's good for exercise. It exercises all parts of you, including your memory, your mind. And it's really fun when somebody asks you what you're doing down at that centre and you say, I'm doing belly dancing, and they look. I mean, it's such a surprise. Why do you think people get so surprised when you tell them? Because I think they're thinking of uh, the dance of the seven veils, you know, but it's not an entertainment <laughs> for men. <laughs> it's always women who do it together, and if we get a man coming through here, he usually looks very embarrassed. <laughs> Belly dance is supposed to be really inclusive. It shouldn't matter what body type or size you have, whether you're petite and really small or, or larger, more voluptuous. We can celebrate our bodies no matter what shape they are. I think it's really good for women. And I see it in the older women. I see them get confidence from it, as well as the physical benefits that come with it. And they have a ton of fun. Like, who gets, what grandma gets to go out and have fun and shake their booty with their friends? How cool is that to find that freedom at this point in your life? Well, you know, it's like, it's like stopping wearing makeup, you know? I wear makeup once a week now. Obviously, I don't have any on today. And <laughs> because, who cares? I let my hair go natural and that was it. Women are, as a, I think in society, we, we tend to feel more self-conscious, like, you know, do we let our hair grow? Do we have our makeup on? Do we let our hair go gray? You know, what clothes do we wear? And in the belly dance, you don't have to worry about any of that. You can just let that go. It's pretty fun to tell your grandkids that you're belly dancing. <laughs> oh boy, you should have seen Mike right now. He had a, he was standing up. Oh yeah, Showing yeah, us his sure, belly yeah. dancing. Yeah, I want to tell your grandkids <laughs> you're belly dancing. That's fantastic. I love it, I love it. Okay, uh, British designer Stella McCartney, like her father, Sir Paul, is a long-standing defender of animal rights. So much so that she included some furry friends at her show at Paris Fashion Week. Models wearing animal costumes strutted on the catwalk to emphasize the label's planet-friendly philosophy. Stella McCartney was one of the first major designers to run anim to shun rather animal-related products. Others have taken up the cause, though rarely in such a tongue-in-cheek manner. Very tongue-in-cheek. Not sure. to prove a point. Mm -hmm. All right, that's it for us. Uh, you can always find this newscast online, cbc.ca/bc. Dan's here at 11. Have a good night.